Let's see this. All right, I'm trying to see if we are live. According to there we go, we are live. That's fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Carlos Phoenix with the Indie Lounge, the Lounge Network, and I am here with a very special guest, an old friend of mine, a TV producer and content creator, um, director, camera guy, host. He does it all, and the guy does it all over the world. His name is Robert Rose, and I want to welcome Robert Rose. Thank you so much for joining us, Robert. Hey, guys. What's going on? How you doing, Carlos? I'm doing great. How are you, man? I'm doing good, man. You know, it's a busy time of year. It's my favorite time of year, the fall. Uh, I'm usually stuck in New York City, and this is my favorite time to be in New York City. So it's the one time of the year I don't mind not traveling. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. does it every all year long, but there's a one time of the year he does it. He likes to travel. I don't like to be in New York in February. Call me crazy, or August. Oh, yeah, it's cold and or it's nasty hot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the whole idea with this gig was to try to avoid bad weather. Um, doesn't always work out that way, but that was, I think, the initial plan when I first started it. Well, let me uh, let me start off with a couple of questions. Um, one uh, for those who may not know who you are. For those who have just never experienced Robert Rose or the show or any right. of your background, let's just uh, mention who you are, what you've done, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, right now I'm uh, the host and producer of Raw Travel. Uh, but before that, um, well, I've always worked in media. So uh, way back a long time ago, I was like an ad sales guy. And then I uh, started producing for myself. Um and have been in business for myself since the year 2000. And, um, you know, I've had a couple of independently produced shows, uh, more than a couple, but uh, uh, I used to produce a Latin show way back in the day called American Latino and another one called Latin Nation. Uh, I create, created those with some uh, other folks, uh, some folks that are working with me right now through Raw Travel uh, and uh, some Latin people, actually, <laughs> some Latinos. So, uh, you know, I did that for about eight years and uh, sold the company, took some time off to travel. And that's where Raw Travel sort of had its genesis. Uh, basically, I was traveling in Latin America and I was just, you know, having these amazing experiences I'd never had before in my life. And um, was just perplexed why those experiences that I was having and other people were having weren't on places like the Travel Channel uh, the travel shows that I saw just were kind of luxury, five-star hotel, uh, really sort of sending out a message that if you want to travel, you need to be rich or famous, um, when uh, actually the opposite is true. Uh, you don't need to be rich or famous. And uh, in many ways, traveling can be um, not only a more rewarding experience than living uh, in the United States, but can be cheaper. Uh, than living in the United States, depending on where you live. I live in Manhattan, so it's kind of expensive. So sometimes I save money when I go travel. So I thought this would be a pretty um, good way to combine my passions of storytelling and traveling and hopefully um, impact people in a positive manner and reflect more accurately uh, the experiences that you can have when you travel and maybe inspire more people to travel because I think when you travel, uh, not only do you enhance your life, you enhance other people's lives, and, uh, and and even when you return, you know those lessons stay with you. And uh, if you're a better person, you make the be yeah, people around you better people as well. In, uh, Sorry about that. Uh, no worries. <laughs> well, that's a long answer, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. You asked me to tell you about myself, so I did. Now, a little bit about your background. Like, where are you from? Where were you born? Uh, well, I'm from Tennessee originally, and I've lived in New York. Uh, off and on for the past 20 years or so, uh, but I lived abroad in Colombia for a year, and I lived in Los Angeles for uh, almost two years. Uh, I loved the L.A. I lived in Santa Monica. You know, uh, I loved being on the beach, but I was a little bit too uh, removed from uh, the daily ch -ch -ch that I need, and so I moved back to New York City, um, where sometimes I wonder if that was the right move or not. 
But, you know, here I am. And what I like about living in either New York or L.A. or a major city is that, you know, allows me to travel. It allows me to get out, get out pretty quickly, uh, though, you know, with the state of air travel these days, I, I wonder sometimes because I don't think I've had a flight land or leave on time in about two years from New York City area, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And some of them are downright, oh, miserable, you know. So you're like, oh, God, how can I? I'm going to continue to do this, you know, it's, it's making life tough, but, um, you know, um, I, I, I hope to do more long-term travel again, like I did when this show actually began. And uh, that might be the answer, you know? Now, what is that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you everybody who's joining us. Um, if you can, and if you think you'll do, this will be fun, we're going to talk a lot about traveling uh, all over the world. And I think a lot of people are really into traveling. So if you would love, to, I would appreciate you if you would share uh, this show and um, and that way, more people that you may know who are into traveling can then learn and ask questions. It's live. It's interactive. So if you're here, please say hello in the comments so that we know that you're there. And uh, he's keeping an eye on your questions. So he's going to answer questions that pop up in real time. So that's cool. All right. So, oh, okay. So we've known each other for a long time. But I've known you, you know, for so long that I, I've never seen you not be in media. Um what got you into media, first of all? And then we're going to go into your travel stuff. Yeah, no, um, it was, uh, you know, in college, I majored in advertising, thinking I was going to work for an ad agency. This is a long time ago. It wasn't the Mad Men era, <laughs> but it was back when advertising was, uh, I don't know, it's kind of sexy, I guess. It was better than, like, my other options, which are like accountant law, law or insurance, you know, which I didn't want to do, um, mainly because I'm really bad at math and there's no way I was going to go to law school. And um, uh, insurance has no interest, though I do it, I am fully covered. Um, but I would say, you know, I was just like majoring in advertising because I didn't have to take accounting. And, uh, you know, when it got time to graduate, I, I was a good student, I had a scholarship and all that stuff, but I didn't really apply myself that much, you know. Uh, I just uh, was trying to sort of skate through. And my last semester, I was like, oh, man, now i got to get a job. You know, I didn't have the luxury of a gap year. Unfortunately, I had, um, you know, some student loans I needed to pay. And so I uh, went out with uh, a radio sales rep in uh, Nashville, my hometown, or close to my hometown. And um, he was a young guy. He was driving like a BMW. He was going, best I could tell, all he did was go around and give away concert tickets and People would love to see him, and they were like, ah, because he was giving them concert tickets. And I was like, I want this guy's job. He's making money. He's making people happy. And, uh, you know, uh, I had never been exposed to that kind of lifestyle. So that's how I got into media. Um, and I remember, you know, always thinking that media had such an influence on people's lives that it would be a good place to be. And I don't know if I thought through that fully of it, but I do remember those thoughts going through my head. And now that I'm in it, um, one of the things that makes me um, so, I guess, satisfied with the career choice I made is, is the fact that media has become extremely influential and uh, much to my dismay, uh, many times in a negative sense. And so what I want to do with Royal Travel is try to counteract that in what little way we can and try to be a positive influence as much as possible. Um, but kind of hard we're independent we're really small but uh i get a lot of satisfaction out of, out of that part of the business now um so you you at some point you decided uh, i'm going to leave this media i'm going to go into travel and you started right. the concepts of raw travel um and if anybody's ever seen our previous episodes over the years um they would know that uh we've discussed that and we've gotten deep into the business aspects of raw travel but this is now five years. This is your fifth season of, of doing this show. And it's uh, one, it, it's very beautifully shot considering that it's completely independent. So for those who have not seen the show, it is 100% completely independently done. He's just out there with a couple of camera dudes. And, and I mean, it's well planned. It's not like he's just randomly showing up places. But, right. you know, it... Um, that's a huge endeavor without a huge production team, production company, uh, right. the backing of a network and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's an, an enormous titanic thing to take over, to, to take on. 
right. did you know it was going to be that difficult initially? It is a lot like the Titanic. Um, <laughs> it feels like. <laughs> they were an iceberg ahead. Uh, yes, I did know that. I, I think I knew that. What I didn't know or didn't think, Carlos, was that I didn't know if it was going to work or not. That's what I didn't know. Uh, but I had this sort of gut instinct, which I follow, um, mainly because it's been pretty good to me. And also because I, f I feel like you got to pursue what is in your heart, right? So it felt like it was in my heart and it was the right thing to do. And I remember thinking how very difficult it was going to be. And was I crazy? Because really, honestly, I was enjoying life. I was just traveling. I was pretty relatively stress-free, but I was also a little bit bored and unfulfilled. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, I got into it. I wanted to marry, you know, uh, uh, video storytelling with traveling. Right. And uh, what has occurred over the last five years, because this is our fifth season, is that storytelling has become uh, in some ways easier because now I can shoot with an iPhone 7, for example, and it's beautiful footage and if the lighting's good and all that stuff. Um and, you know, you have all these things like drone shots now that are you're going to see a lot in um, season five that really add to the production value. Osmos, which give it the steady cam look. And these are very relatively inexpensive ways to up the production value. Um, that said, it is an incredibly difficult enterprise, not from the production point of view as much, even though it is from the production point of view, but from the business side of things. We have 168 affiliates. So corralling wow. all those affiliates that's that's kind of tough you know and that's a that's a, a result of consolidation in the media industry which has been good to us but i don't necessarily think it's good for the industry or for um you know diversity of voices and things like that um but what, because what we are uh just because you know when when you have a clear channel you know uh or someone like clear channel what are they iHeartRadio radio now programming to 300 markets you're going to hear the same radio formats, market to market, generally speaking. And the same thing could very easily happen to TV, and I think that's wrong. Um, I think it's not good. I think with TV strengths that it has, broadcast TV in particular, or local TV, is their localism and their ability to be local. Um, and, um, you know, cable has done a good job of, uh, you know, uh, kicking broadcast TV's butt creatively over the last 20 years, but now they're getting their butts kicked from Netflix and, and online. And so now it's a little bit of a free for all and broadcast as an opportunity as a renaissance uh, medium. And, uh, and it is becoming that way. People don't want to pay for cable, can get TV over the air for free. And for me, I don't care if it's on TV, it's on the internet, it doesn't matter. I just got to be able to make a living. And if I can make a living and put out a product, then I'll, I'll keep doing it. Sweet. All right. So cool. Now, You've done four seasons. Uh, can you break down the types of seasons that you've had, like the locations you've been to? Yeah, so season one was largely Latin America, and that's because we I was living in Colombia when the show actually began production. Um, and so uh, we just finished it out. You know, we knew Latin America. My camera uh, partners, the, the collaborators were Spanish-speaking, and we knew Latin America. So we literally bust all the way through Central America um, uh, through season one. So from Mexico down to Panama with a few stops like in Argentina, that was season one. Season two, we got a little more diverse and went to Eastern Europe, one of my favorite trips of all time. Uh, we did uh, six weeks in Eastern Europe filming uh, with a, a different crew. Um, and then, uh, then I went to Asia and, uh, and then started experimenting with some U.S. destinations as well. So season two, we started getting more diverse. Uh, season three, we did a road trip through uh, Western United States, uh, Utah, Colorado, a trip I'd always personally wanted to take. And one of my most fulfilling episodes, uh, maybe not the most beautiful, you know, looking, but storytelling, one of my most fulfilling was at the Pine Ridge Native American Reservation in South Dakota, the poorest county in the United States. Being there on the 4th of July, um, partaking of a 4th of July powwow in the poorest county in the United States. Um, was uh, mind blowing. It was just it was so emotional, man. Uh, it still is. And then um, season four, uh, we went to the Caribbean and we snuck into Cuba. And I say snuck in, meaning that, you know, I don't mind saying, man, I went through Mexico. 
I didn't tell Fidel. He wasn't alive, I don't think, but I didn't tell his brother Raul that we were there. And, um, you know, I was nervous out of my mind because they do bad things to people who sneak in, journalists in particular, uh, and maybe don't report in. I'm just glad they didn't put sonic uh, uh, terrorism in my ears like they did the U.S. Embassy, uh, or, you know. And so I, but the reason we snuck into Cuba is we wanted to show a real side of Cuba. Uh, and then went to Haiti, which was also kind of bucket list kind of ep episode I wanted to produce because I'd always been curious about Haiti. Um, wanted to see it in my own eyes, what was going on there, and uh, helped tremendously. Season five uh, is a little mix, mishmash of everything, man. We got Peru. Uh, we've got uh, one more episode for Quebec, Canada. We shot a lot when we were there. Um, we've got Guadeloupe coming up, uh, which is, uh, if you guys don't know where that is, it's not in Mexico. It's in the French Caribbean. It's beautiful islands, pretty much untouched by the hurricanes, uh, thank goodness. Um, and we've got um, Spain and Italy. I mean, sorry, Spain and Portugal. We took a river cruise. Uh, and then we're taking another cruise on a really interesting barge ship through the Marquesas Islands, uh, which is in French Polynesia. Uh, and then we got the Azores coming up. So we got a lot, a lot, and then maybe China. So a lot of stuff coming on at season five. Let's keep talking about it. I'm going to get exhausted and have to take a nap. So. <laughs> Too many right. places. So, so I'm showing a little bit of a preview. I think that's Peru. Yeah, that's Peru. That's this weekend's episode. Awesome. Or maybe actually that's next weekend's episode. We did two episodes for the Southern Road Trip, so that's yeah. next weekend's episode. So, yeah, we did uh, season one. Uh, this first episode is uh, the, the Southern Coast, and then we continued the journey. And uh, so we're doing a lot of those. We'll do one installment, and then there'll be a second installment, uh, sort of completing the story. Because a half, 20 minutes is tough. 20, 20 minutes is tough to tell a story, you know, so we'll break it up sometimes. All right, so somebody let's asked me. Yes, yeah, there's some sorry, comments. Go ahead. Now, somebody asked me if we were going to go to Panama soon. I'm like, we were there in season one. So that'll be online at some point this year. So, yeah, so uh, I wanted to say hello to Mia, Walter, Johanna. Um, thank you guys for joining. Please share if you think uh, friends and family would enjoy learning and, and knowing more about not only the show, but traveling in general. Um, and Walter saying, uh, glad you visited, visited Argentina. And, yeah, uh, and then one, Johanna. Love is, Argentina. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and Johanna wants to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> As we all. Okay. Yeah. In fact, in fact, before we that. went live, I even asked. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> I said, hey, uh, I'm sending my application. So Does that mean you want to get paid, Johanna? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, we, we're a small, tight crew, and it's it's not that we're uh, – trust me, people want to work with us till they go on a trip with us, and then it's sometimes I, it's, it's hard, man. It's hard getting people that um, have experience that want to – it's hard. It's just tough, man. Shoot yeah, like previous episodes that we've – um, now, it, remember, it's just completely independent. So you don't have security. You don't have, like, bodyguards. Um, you know, in previous episodes, we've talked. In fact, I think we were in your apartment in New York. And we had talked about how you've been to some countries and and they blatantly robbed you. Yeah, well, I hate getting ripped off, man, whether I'm in the United States or anywhere else. It's like the one thing in my brain. There's something passed down generations through my Irish heritage, I guess, where – if something negative happened to you, you had to like fight for yourself because no one else was going to fight for you. So that um, instinct is full on when I'm traveling. I'm pretty much like, you know, my best version of myself when I travel, I think. And that's what I like about it uh, because I um, empathy is there. Everything is there. I'm not worried about my day to day problems. I'm more observing and, and introspective. But when somebody rips me off, even if it's just like a dollar in the taxi, um, I, can, I can really get, I can get really, you know, angry about that. And so we did an episode called When Travel Goes Wrong that I really love um, this season because uh, those were hard-earned segments. And a lot of it was filmed with the iPhone, um, you know, not great sound. That's why we haven't done it before, but stranded in now the I can Accra you how airport. Use, you know, good audio on your iPhone, but we'll get into that no, next time. No, yeah, and we're definitely getting into that now, but a lot of this was from four or five years ago, and quite frankly, we had no idea that we were going to do an episode, so we were just, you know, 
a lot of times you didn't even think to document it until after the fact. Uh, but, you know, we were stranded in the uh, Kra Ghana airport for 18 hours thanks to South African Airways, and they were just lying to their customers, and we were like, you know what? I understand that they have mechanical issues, but the way they're handling it is criminal, and so we're going to film this. And so when travel goes wrong, uh, you know, we talk about that. Now, I believe them out because I don't want to put up with the legal issues of, of having some, them do a cease and desist. But now you know, if you're watching this webcast, who it was. And uh, the bottom line is we want to hold people to task and say, these are travelers, man. And just be, when people are traveling, they're sort of, um, you know, they're in a vulnerable position. And I'm happy to say that 90% of the human race, when someone is vulnerable, they will take care of them. And that is a wonderful feeling. But that 10% or 5% or whatever that percentage is that has the opposite reaction, well, those are the people I want to take to task. And those are the people, whether it be a corporation or a human being that doesn't treat people properly, um, I'm going to expose them. I'm going to do whatever I can. If they try to mug me, I'm going to fight. You know, this is what I'm going to do. Now, okay, uh, going back to comments. Uh, Walter wants to work with you for free. But Walter, somebody has to pay for those plane tickets and all that type of stuff, so it's not really free. Uh, Don't do it, Walter. Just enjoy travel, brother. That's what uh, I say. Lay, Lay, Lay says, um, did you eat anything that you got sick from? So have you ever? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, basically. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, a couple times. Uh, one of them you'll see on When Travel Goes Wrong um, in Mexico, first season, first shoot of <laughs> season one, really. Uh or like maybe day two. And so uh, I think it was because I love my crew, but sometimes, you know, they wanted to eat spaghetti. And I'm like, really? In Mexico City? So we went and had spaghetti, and I don't know, me and when, uh, Renzo, we had spaghetti. We both got sick. I got sicker than Renzo, but um, uh, Moses had something else. He didn't. Well, they're using so their water. Exactly. It was stupid. Yeah, so we shouldn't have eaten spaghetti. But I didn't want spaghetti. I wanted tacos, man. I'm like, you're in Mexico. You have Mexican food. But, you know, we try to, you know, be democratic when we're traveling. Uh, and then in South Africa, I got super, super ill. Um, and I'm pretty sure I was eating. We were touring an eco-friendly garden. And she was like, eat that. And I just ate it. And then the next day, I was so <laughs> ill. Um, but you know, my on camera persona. So basically on camera, I'd be like, eh. and as soon as camera script rolling, I just went and put my head on the oh. thing. It was just so sick, so very sick, but because we have money on the, we have episodes we have to do. People are getting paid. I can't afford to take a day off and just chill. All right. Uh, so my own mother is watching this show and she's asking, when do you plan on going right. to Dubai? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I actually, we're actually broadcasting Dubai on Nat Geo People, and nice. I have a, an old uh, college chum who sees me and messages me when he sees me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about Dubai. Uh, I'm very interested in that whole area of the world. Um, Dubai doesn't strike me as the rawest of travel there, but um, culturally, I think it definitely would qualify. And we're trying to sort of expand what it means to be a raw traveler. It doesn't always mean going to Haiti. I mean, traveling to Haiti is rough. So explain a little Cuba bit of that. Explain the rawness uh, that we're talking about. Yeah, I think raw could just be real, authentic. And, and however that is, and I mean, we went to see a flamenco show in Spain, and somebody posted, like, you know, too many tourists or you can do better. And I'm like, really? Flamenco? <laughs> like, it's a negative thing to go see a flamenco show while you're in Spain? That's just ridiculous. So we try not to get caught up on the definitions. Like what I'm trying to do is broaden travel to as many different people as possible. So as many different people as possible will take a trip, whether that's volunteering in Haiti or doing a river cruise in Spain, two wildly different trips. You know what? I like them both. And some people won't do the river cruise, but we'll do the volunteerism. Some people, the opposite. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. So long as you're having an authentic, real, genuine experience, and, and you're growing out of that. I think it's, uh, it's a worthwhile trip. Now, Rob, if I can have you just center yourself just a little bit into camera. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying <laughs> to stay the sun. But... We're like watching it like this. Okay, cool. Now, um, I'm going to take a quick break. It is not a commercial break. What I do want to show, though, it is a, um, a promotion of your show. 
So I want to be able to show okay. someone, and it, you know, if we, we may have people who've never seen your show. So I want to show at least a trailer yeah. of what that looks like and um, have them get exposed to your content. So let me cue that up and. Peru's coastal region is the definition of surreal beauty, where vast, dusty deserts give way to deep ocean waters brimming with sea life. Many travelers aren't even aware of the natural splendor, unique culture, and diverse adventures awaiting those who explore here. Locals know all too well how to escape the jam-packed Gringo Trail. We're hooking up with some and taking a road slightly less traveled as we head from Lima down Peru's southern coast exploring attractions and towns along the way. Come with us as we explore Peru's magnificent Southern Pacific Coast. Travel. For some, it's a luxurious escape or maybe an adrenaline-filled adventure. But if you're like me, it's a precious opportunity to discover and to give back. It's time to get real. It's time to get raw. It's time for raw travel. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> I love your like the, the the whole like voiceover stuff that you do. All right, cool deal. So, oh yeah. Uh, so it's gonna be my. That's your signature. My my plan B if uh, Plan A doesn't work out. Well, it's been five years, so. I'm not in the union. Yeah, man. No, no. I, I actually enjoy voiceovers. I do them here in my apartment, right back here. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, on the Zoom mic, I'll do them on the road. So it's technology's awesome, man. Sometimes when it works. All right, a couple of. Oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna put some comments on screen sorry. here. Hey, good to see you, Tito. Tito from Chicago. So uh, this shows the best, says Tam. Um, Peace and truth by Mia. And Johanna says, "I am most at home when I'm traveling." That's good. That means the world is your home. Yeah, me too. So that's right. Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, John. You were talking about your uh, when you go take your vacations and you're giving back um, and you have a name for it. The vac um, volunteerism. Volunteerism. So, uh, want to just touch a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who donated um, back in uh, the spring. We were. Um, our camera guy that we hired in Peru, he was a German expat living in Peru, had a Peruvian wife and a couple of kids. And um, he actually was not, uh, he's more of a still photographer than a videographer, but I hired him because I knew he could do videography. But I also hired him mainly because uh, Sasha, Sasha was his name, he was all about volunteerism. He's done many trips, done many different things. And, uh, you know, he hit me up with this idea. There's this poor school that his sister-in-law um, taught at an elementary school uh, with like 100 kids, really in very rural Peru, and they couldn't afford school supplies, and they couldn't afford school uniforms and whatnot. So we were like, you know, how can we help these guys and also create a segment for the show? And so we are like, well, let's get our viewers involved, because viewers are always asking me when they see something, they're like, how can I help out? <clears throat> so we thought, <clears throat> excuse me, this would be a really good way, <clears throat> excuse me, for them to be able to participate and help out. And so basically, um, I don't know, you know, 18 or so folks uh, donated anywhere from five to 50, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and we bought, we, we, our goal is 500 bucks. 500 bucks buys a lot of school supplies. That's what I love about giving back. It's like, it doesn't need, you don't need a lot of money. Uh, you don't need to be the Red Cross. You do not need to be, you know, World Vision to have an impact. You can do it one on one. And so we were able to raise uh, 590 bucks above our goal. We bought pencils, paper, just the most basic of stuff for these kids that were so cute. And um, you know, it's it's basically the most uh, fulfilling part of this show. Period. And a story for me. And that's a segment of uh, your I don't show. Know if it gets every episode. <clears throat> It is, man, and I don't care if it ever makes money or not. I'm always going to do that, and if uh, the show doesn't work out, I'll still do that. And uh, I've even thought about just traveling abroad, volunteering, and just documenting that when this is all said and done. Uh, probably, probably will do that because I believe in it, not just from a point of view of like you know helping people or <clears throat> just for what it means to me, what it means to people, 
um, what it says about the human race because it's so easy to, to get down on the human race. Um, and, you know, with all the negativity and divisiveness, to think that this is horrible, that this, you know, this, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, and maybe it is, but the reality is we're in less wars than ever before. And the reality is, uh, if you are in need, 95% of the world's population will help you. <clears throat> so we want to make sure that uh, people in the United States in particular are not cynical about the world because we live in a bubble, you know? And uh, sometimes it's a good bubble, sometimes it's not a good bubble. You get now, outside that bubble and see how the rest of the world lives. So talk, talk a little bit about that. So here you are, you're basically an American, <laughs> and you go to some areas that are more rural than the touristy locations. <laughs> And, you know, uh, speaking of the bubble, sometimes we go to countries and we don't realize that people don't look upon America the same way we would. Like, yeah, of course, we're America. So any, anything right. you want to add to that? Well, I would just say I'm amazed at people's capacity to judge people by the individual. Like, they may not agree politically with the United States, uh, you know, depending on where you go. Um, but I've never had any negativity for being an American. Um, it was a great experience when I lived in Colombia as a gringo uh, because I was the other. And whenever you've been the other, you become more empathetic to other others. And so, for example, when I moved back and, um, you know, I'm not – a minority, I guess, uh, so to speak, but I sort of got a taste for what that felt like or could feel like uh, to always sort of stand out. And um, most of those experiences, 99% of them were good. Uh, you still, like I said, get that 1% where somebody tries to take advantage of you, rob you, do whatever, um, you know, and that's where I really take offense, not just for what happens to me, but what about other travelers? What about elderly travelers? What about female travelers? people that are vulnerable and anyone that would take advantage of a vulnerable person. Um, you know, I, I, I have no qualms about calling them out on it, uh, letting them know how I feel and, um, you know, kicking their ass if we have to, whatever. Now, what are your highlights of doing this show? I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of like tiredness and, and, and all that, all that traveling is exhausting. Um, I, I do very little travel yeah. and I get exhausted just thinking about it. So, but what, yeah. what are the good things? What are the highlights of the show, of doing, not the show, but your experiences doing the show? Well, I think I'm almost a jet, um, like addicted to jet lag now um, <clears throat> because it, I kind of get a buzz out of it. I'm like, oh, sleep deprivation. I remember this. And then <laughs> sort of moving through the fog. What's tough is filming like that. Um, and, uh, but there's tricks to the trade. You know, obviously I drink a lot of coffee. Um, but I don't look great on camera, you know, really tired. And the older I get, the less I want to look at myself on camera. I never did really want to. Um, and so, you know, the older I get, the, the more difficult that gets to be to say, ah, oh, yeah, I look tired. But I quit being vain, ironically, when I put myself on TV, because I think I thought I was cool before I put myself on TV. And then I'm like, you're actually kind of geeky, nerdy, whatever, kind of a goofball. And uh, when you think you're trying to be cool, <laughs> so I'm like, all right, it's freedom. <laughs> Suddenly I'm like, oh, I don't have to be cool all the time or be cooler than school, right? And um, just be yourself. And so I've tried to just be myself. Every now and then I catch myself being, a, a, you know, a jerk. And I don't mean to be, but it's just how you come across on camera and things taken out of context. And sometimes I am, you know, uh, I'm a human being. So... Um, you know, what I love about travel, though, is when I'm away from the camera and I'm able to go out and just be among regular people. And I remember this one experience I had when I was in Serbia. My crew, I let them sleep in, week and hard, week and hard, everybody was just two weeks. And I went to this sort of, I just ran in the middle of Belgrade, Serbia. And, uh, you know, the jet lag. It's probably emotional, like it does certain things to you, maybe, you know, like that you wouldn't normally think. But I was moved to tears just by hanging out in a park with these people because they were so, um, um, you could tell they had a hard life, man. They had just been through a war. Um, they had a hard life. And you could see it etched on their faces. And I just felt for them so much. 
um, I would have loved to have given them all a group hug, you know. And and when that happens, um, you know, as bittersweet as that feels, um, I, 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 I've come down to earth and I get better perspective because it's so easy to get caught up into, like, you know, producing the show and trying to make it a success and getting your ego. I love it when the ego is put to the side and, and you see how other people live. It's awesome. Now, um, audience, uh, those who want to say hello, please say hello. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please, if you have any questions that you might want answered, maybe about a place that you want to go to, he's pretty much covered most of the planet with the exception of a couple of um, Antarctic continents. Uh, and I don't know if that's part of the plans, but um, I just yeah. wanted to let it, uh, give out an opportunity for everybody who's watching live. The, the benefit of being live is that you can participate and you can ask questions, and we're here to do that for you. All right, so um, let's talk about some of the hardships in the countries like you just mentioned. Uh, where have you seen, have you gone and maybe not expected it to be in worse conditions than you thought? Uh, you mean uh, where it was worse than I thought going in or it was yes. not as bad as I thought? Oh, worse than I thought. Like well, you got there and you're like, oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. And, and this situation uh, well, is just dire. If, if you've well, even experienced see, that. Yeah, no, I have. Uh, uh, Haiti, I knew it was going to be bad in Haiti. Uh, my my uh, co-producer, camera guy, Renzo, had been before. And so he told me some stories. Young kids eating dirt because of the iron deficiency in their diet. Distended bellies. Um, when I was in Ghana, I remember we were hanging out. And there was, uh, you know, we were at a farm. And I saw this kid. He was so cute. And playing for the camera. And. I remember I got back and saw the footage. I'm like, oh, his, his belly's distended. He's he hasn't he doesn't get good nutrition. Um, you know, so when you see some people don't want to see that, I get it. You know, but I do uh, because I want to see reality. Because then I feel like I'm I'm not hiding from that, and uh, maybe I can help in some way. And so when we were at um, in Haiti. It was it was definitely as bad or worse than I expected. Um, you know, power went out. It was a challenging shoot. Um, it was everything that, you know, you're told about Haiti. But it was also, as in most cases, the most shocking and it was the most one of the most fulfilling because we, we, you know, went to the Freedom House where they take care of kids who are actually sold into slavery by the parents because they can't afford to um, take care of them. They're called Restavics and they're given to families who are supposed to adopt them and take them to school and take care of them and instead use them as servants. And so these kids have been rescued and um, at Freedom House, just a great organization, and the children were just awesome. I mean, kids, man, it's hard, it's hard, man. When you were kids, it's like, it's hard for me to keep it together sometimes. Um, I try not to get too emotional when I'm there. I just try to have a good time and absorb it. And, uh, you know, at, at the same time that it was worse, Carlos, it also in many ways was better. It's like, it's not, you know, Mad Max and Thunderdome. It's not everybody's for himself kind of thing. There's a society here and there's people actually, you know, helping each other out and there's some sense to this. So in many ways, Haiti was both. It was both worse and better in many ways. And and that's the, 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 the thing I found everywhere I went. Um, the one exception to all that rule saying it's worse but not better would be Cuba. Cuba's worse than I expected, and um, it's just, it's a sad place, man, in my, in my view. It's a sad place. Mm. No human rights, man, and it just bums me out. Um, yeah, that's hard to hear. Um, uh, I do want to touch on some of these comments before I let them build up too much. So let's see, um, one person said, uh, proud to air raw travel on my air. That's from Pamela. Uh, I love everything about <laughs> this show. Providence. There we go. Thank you, Amy. Pam. Nice to see you guys. First Thank time you, to Amy. watch Facebook Live. Very cool. Uh, yeah, we, we should do some more of these. And what was the most dangerous experience that you've had? Uh, I mean, I've been robbed uh, and mugged, and, and those make great stories, but they're not the typical travel experience, so I try to stay away from them. Um, but what I think that has done is it's like affected my psyche a little bit. So I'm uber careful. Uh, even in New York, if I'm at a Starbucks, like I don't let go of my computer bag. It's with me at all times because I have been robbed. Um, so just little tricks of the trade. I'm a much smarter person because of that. But one time we were in the Philippines and we were supposed to take 
a bus from Angela City back to Manila. Um, our guide, uh, Chef Claude, had left us off. He used to take this bus. It wasn't leaving for an hour. So this guy came up, and we were tired. We wanted to get home and sleep. It's like, oh, I got a taxi for you right here. We're like, oh, should we consider it? Should we negotiate? We get in the taxi, and the guy that's driving, our taxi driver, has a weird tick. He's like sniffing and making this funny noise. And then next thing he's on the phone with speaking Tagalog. Uh, and I don't know what's going on. I had convinced myself that we were kidnapped. Hmm. And, you know, and I was sitting there thinking, okay, well, there's three of us. And I had a female camera operator and a male camera operator. And so I was like, well, three on one, but he's probably calling his buddies and they're going to meet us. And, and I, you know, I don't know, man, fatigue. I don't know why this was going through my head, but there was something a little fishy about this. And I look back and my camera crew, they were asleep, blissfully unaware of what's going on in my head. And I'm like, okay, I guess I have to take care of this myself. He pulls over at a gas station and, you know, no explanation or nothing. I'm like, here it is. We're they're, You know, they're at least, I'm like, okay, what equipment can we give them? You know, how can I hang on to my hard drives? Because that's the thing, the hard drives. Hmm. That's what's got all the footage from the show. That's what you don't want to lose. The equipment, you know, insurance can replace. And um, long story short, man. He stopped to get some cigarettes or something and dropped us off in Manila and there was no issue. We were never kidnapped. And uh, I felt like an idiot, you know, but I tell that story because sometimes your paranoia is your best friend and sometimes it's your worst enemy. And uh, you just got to follow your instinct. Um, it, it can be scary, man. But, uh, you know, I live in New York City and it's way scarier walking past Port Authority uh, than it is um, traveling halfway across the world to me. Right. There's always shenanigans at the Port Authority in New York City. Always will be. <laughs> Bus stations. That's true. Always some shenanigans. I read the New York Post and I'm like, yep, shenanigans. <laughs> so Walter is asking, um, and oh, the question just left. Hold on. Somebody just put a big comment. Okay. Jo Johanna taking over the screen here. But uh, let me just quickly go back to Walter. I'd like to know how, ma uh, mainly how do you finance your trips? Uh, do you have sponsors, investors? Um, and just a reminder, this is a completely yeah. independent show. So it's really just a couple of camera people and and Robert, uh, but uh, I'll let him answer that question. Yeah, so we are independent. So what that means is, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, it's one hundred percent self finance, which is why you don't see probably more travel independent travel shows on the air because you have to dig pretty deep uh, to do it, even though you do it on a shoestring like we did. Um, but you know, it's a entrepreneurial gamble. So uh, and it, it paid off because now we do have sponsorship uh it does pay for itself uh we're not getting rich at all uh it's definitely not doing what it should be doing revenue wise but you know it works for me but i don't really do it for the money if i was doing it for the money i'd do something else um because um there's definitely not a lot of money uh, you know rolling through the door at this point in time but it's enough to uh keep me going for a while and uh, we're in season five we'll see see how long it, if it goes you know i don't think i'll go to season 10 I don't see that happening. So somewhere between five and 10, you'll probably see it. I doubt if we're here five years from now with me having this conversation. Uh, um, but I could it, be wrong. Is this my job you know, application somebody might take over? <laughs> <laughs> somebody, that's what I'm saying, man. You know, like it's wide open. The future right. is wide open. Now, David makes appointments on his uh, device to watch Raw Travel. So he schedules it and makes sure he catches each episode. So that's great, David. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, Make sure now, you watch the commercials, David. Yeah, because that's what pays for everything. <laughs> All right, so Johanna says, I typically travel solo and agree with you that 95% of humanity are wonderful, uh, helpful individuals who would never harm or take advantage of anyone. I've been to Central America, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, uh, but not solo. I will be visiting Panama solo. Staying, I'm sorry that I'm reading this whole thing in voiceover mode. Um, staying in Casco Viejo. And a single female, as a single female, should I be more concerned about uh, than I would be traveling solo in Europe capital? And in, in a European capital, how's the public transportation? Casco Viejo, that's in Panama City, the old city, I believe. So uh, you should be great. Um, um, Panama has had some issues in uh, northern Panama or near the Costa Rican border. Um, Bocas del Toro, I think it's called. Um, it's like a serial killer up there. We went there, but I, there was like a serial killer. I don't know if they caught him. I'm not sure. 
um, a couple of female travelers. And, and I hate to just, you know, I don't want to be like alarming people, but I'm just saying, you know, I don't know the, the ins and outs. I think there's a lot of, whenever stuff happens in Latin America, usually it's like, it has to do with um, uh, the cartel and drugs and, and, and stuff like that. So it's not like the average people. It's not like somebody's trying to kill you. And that's why as a tourist and a traveler, you're probably okay because you're not going to get involved in those shenanigans. I'm on my best behavior. Uh, you know, I lived in Colombia where they're like, you know, do you want some gum, cocaine, whatever? And I'm like, nope, I don't. I don't even want to eat cocoa. <laughs> like, oh you know, like I would never, ever do that anywhere, but especially in Colombia as a foreigner. And that just is crazy to me that anybody would take those risks. But, you know, different strokes for different folks, man. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, for me, I, I, I'm on my best behavior, and I have some funny stories I'll tell at some point in my book when I write it about, you know, living in Colombia and, and uh, just the different experiences I had while I was living there. It was, it was uh, life-changing. It was awesome. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope I answered your question, John. You know, I'm a bad guy to ask. So I'm a guy. <laughs> uh, but we're trying to touch on, you know, female travels. And, and most of the females that I have talked to and I've interviewed, uh, they've never had a problem. Follow your instincts, ask around locally, do your research online, um, you know, read the dangers and annoyances section in your guidebook, make sure you get a recent guidebook, and then supplement it with some online research, and I bet you'll be quite okay. Yeah, and, and just put your, uh, you know, in my little experience in traveling and haven't been in Europe, um, just uh, keep your guard up, you know, don't drink things you yeah. don't know where those drinks came from. Things of that nature, because right. uh, as a woman, I know there's a lot of aggressive men yeah. in different territories. So you just definitely want to be aware of that. And it's not that they're more dangerous than the U.S. I think they're actually True. less dangerous than the U.S. In many ways, it's that you're a tourist somewhere. So you don't, you don't know, and that's what makes you vulnerable. And that's where, you know, hanging out where they hang out is a good idea, as opposed to where tourists hang out. Another reason why I like to go and live like a local is... Um, that seems to be where most of the pickpockets and things like that is where tourist areas are because those are the t targets, you know. Uh, but Europe in general, especially Eastern Europe, I think it's so safe, man. Really, really safe. Two safest areas, I think, are uh, parts of Asia. Laos was incredibly safe, felt incredibly safe. I could be wrong, but it felt safe. It just don't step on a U.S. landmine from Vietnam. Um, you know, the, you do have to watch yeah, out safe. for that, ironically. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, you know, if you're Especially on the tourist you you'll be fine. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, you know, and, and the, that's another example of locals there. Something I had no idea, you know, having to put up with that still this many years later, people losing limbs and whatnot. And not one person was negative or anything but sweet and wonderful to us as Americans. They don't hold that against us. And um, I think that's pretty amazing. Now, um you you wanted to mention a contest. If, I'll, I'll bring that up before we forget. Yeah. So let's yeah. Uh, talk so about that. Um, yeah. So it's our fifth season, guys. So what this means is we're going to try to celebrate the entire year, uh, and uh, we're going to kick it off with what is called the Raw Travel Giveaway. Contest hasn't begun yet. It begins next weekend, but it's called uh, the Raw Travel Giveaway. You can go to rawtravelgiveaway.com and win a trip for two to Guadalupe. Um, Guadalupe is, is an easy trip. It's not far. It's like a three-day little quick getaway. You can stay in the same place I stayed at. Uh, the Guadalupe episodes, we've got two of them, are coming this fall. Uh, and so the Guadalupe Tourism Bureau and um, uh, Norwegian Airlines have been kind enough to offer that uh, for us to give away. Uh, you got plenty of time. It'll be in December when we draw, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be a nice little spring getaway. Um, after that, we'll still have more prizes, and we're going to do more giveaways, little to small, uh, books, travel gear, uh, obviously our little raw travel hats. Um, it's like my favorite little premium, um, you know, small stuff like that to actual trips. So, uh, you know, stay tuned, stay socially engaged, watch the show every week because different things are going to be happening. And uh, if you're engaged on Facebook, maybe engage on Twitter or Instagram. Um, you know, I'm not trying to show for more social media followers, but I will tell you that the more we have, the easier our life gets. Yeah. Now, uh, you, you have a bunch of products. You've given me some products, uh, the hat and the water bottle thing. Uh, is that something that people can buy or? 
Yeah, yeah. We have a site. Uh, if you go to rawtravel.tv slash merch, I think you can uh, find links. So if you don't win, you can buy it. Um, so just go to rawtravel.tv and look under merch. We don't have a lot. Uh, it's not a huge money maker, and I have to lick the envelopes and mail them out to you myself. So <laughs> sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, but I haven't sold a hat in a while, but it has been summer. So, you know, the hat, I'll try to find one here and model one for you in a bit. Um, and I'll send you one, Carlos. You might need one down in Atlanta. Um, but the little knit hats, you know, the water bottles and stuff, they're for sale. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to try to give them away. I try to give away a few every, uh, every quarter. So, cool. yeah, you guys can do that. And uh, but I think exciting, more exciting is going to be some of the gear from some of our sponsors. Um, we got a great trip to Iceland, guys. With a um, we partnered with this uh, travel. They're called the the the, the travel yogi, and uh, she puts together yoga trips all over the world. And just a great organization, and they really hooked us up in Iceland. That's a beautiful shoot. It's not a cheap place to go, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And that's going to be one of my, my favorite episodes. I told you about Guadalupe. We did a river cruise in Spain and uh, uh, Portugal. That was just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. We were the only Americans on their boat. And uh, it was great not to have to pack and unpack. And, uh, you know, I loved it. I, I loved river cruises. I thought it was awesome. Sweet. So, okay, so tell me more. I want, I want to know more about stuff. That, what's coming out on the, five, on the fifth season? And you mentioned Peru. Mission Guadalupe, yeah. is that right? Or Guatemala? Guadalupe, yeah. No, Guadalupe. Guadalupe, okay. French Caribbean islands. So, uh, you know, after this season, you'll know exactly about Guadalupe because we're going to delve pretty deep into it. Um, and then uh, we've got a couple of U.S. episodes I would like to mention. Houston. We already did one Houston episode. Everybody knows about Hurricane Harvey. We had planned to do a second one, and we shot it. Luckily, we were able to shoot it. And it's called Eclectic H-Town, and it's going to be airing um, in November, and you'll be able to help the Hurricane Harvey. And right now, what you're showing is uh, some B-roll from another U.S. episode. It's called RV Road Trip Through the Great Smoky Mountains, which is the reason all those photos of me as a kid pop up is because I, I, being from Tennessee, I used to travel there as a kid a lot. So what we did is we got a, uh, an RV and took off for three days. I've never did, driven an RV in my life. And we took off for three days, went through the Smoky Mountains where they had a recent fire. And uh, they are just trying to get uh, rebuild. We were helping them with the rebuilding and letting them know that, you know, the Smoky Mountains is open for business. There's a lot, it's a tourist-driven economy. Uh, there's a lot of charm, a lot of good people there in the Smoky Mountains. So that's me on the RV there. And went to Asheville, North Carolina, uh, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge. Uh, all those places in Tennessee that I used to go as a kid. It was pretty cool to go back as an adult, but with an RV. Uh, now, have you ever uh, gone an RV, Carlos? Yeah, uh, not, uh, I mean, in, in the film industry, yes, but not like traveling. Okay. Not like traveling. It's pretty, it's interesting. It's got its own little, like, tricks of the trade kind of thing. You pull in the RV park and you hook up and right. you get to meet other RVers. And, you know, people think it's just for, like, old retirees and whatnot. But I'm like, you know, honestly, any age could do it you don't have to be i didn't wait until i got gray hair to do it it just so happened that's what happened you know now, for those sorry who are still you had a watching, question i interrupted you no no you're fine uh those who are still watching please share again um if you if you're just joining us and uh people who might be interested in travel friends and family of yours might be interested in that plus if you've never seen the show be sure to check it out um rawtravel.tv will have the listings of your local providers that will be carrying the show it's in all 50 states and then some, as you mentioned before. And um, so uh, you, you mentioned uh, Gatlinburg. Right. You know, where we have uh, bikers. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Sorry yeah, about I, I didn't that. know what that was. <laughs> Sorry, no, it wasn't loud. Uh, I have the door open because it's nice and cool out. But, um, all right, yeah. Gatlinburg, there was a major fire what, about a year or so ago. Isn't that right? Or were you there before or after those fires? No, so we, we went uh, over the summer, and the fires were last October 2000. I mean, I'm sorry, I think it was December 2016 uh, uh -huh. or November. I'm not sure, guys. Uh, but I know it was in the fall of 2016, and it was pretty devastating. Smoky Mountains has never had a fire like that before. I think. Um, and it know, went right through town. So, so yeah, there's. I went know right through the... town. People died. 
people yeah. die because they're not used to that. It's not like California where they have this, you know, plan of action. And uh, it was just a once in a hundred years event. We're having a lot of these lately. Coincidental, huh? Uh, but it seems like we're having all these weather events that we don't normally have. Uh, anyway, Smoky Mountains did it, you know, and I always said sort of tongue in cheek, like when Hillbilly Golf gets damaged, damn it, I got to do something about it. And uh, so, you know, it, it literally was an idea where, um, you know, Go RVing is a, a sponsor of ours this fall. I said, let me, let me get an RV and I'll have that first experience, but I want to go somewhere where I used to go as a kid that needs some help. They need some help getting back on their feet. And there's a lot of people that maybe don't aren't aware of the charm and beauty of the Great Smoky Mountains, or more importantly, the culture of East Tennessee, Western North Carolina, the Appalachia, Lower Appalachia. Um, you know, they call them hillbillies. And it used to be a derogatory term, but now it's kind of a point of pride because it's just like, you know, a particular genre of music I like is called uh, hillbilly punk. And, uh, you know, it's like many things. People are embracing it now, and they're saying, you know, this is a prideful culture. It's something to be proud of. Let's don't, let's don't lose this culture. So it's all about hanging on to that culture, celebrating that culture. Um, and that's what I want to do with the show, irregardless of we're in another country or our own country, is basically tell people, you know, they need to be proud of where they are and who they are and where they're from. Um, places that used to have Afri slaves, like in Peru, uh, the next weekend we're going to – Afro-Peruvian community uh, where slaves were there and they were smuggled in and we go to the tunnels where they were smuggled in and it, it was a very emotional experience. All those places where there's an African influence have such rich culture and um, they don't need to be pushed under the table. They need to be celebrated, man, and we need to recognize them and, and go visit them. If you go to Colombia outside of Cartagena, there's a place called San Basilio de Palenque. Uh, it was a small town about an Two, uh, two hours, I think, outside of Cartagena. Kind of difficult to get to, but they still speak an African dialect from back in the day. Escaped slaves uh, established it, and they had to get far away where they wouldn't come pursue them. And if you go there, you're not going to have a typical travel experience. You're going to have a pretty wild one, pretty good one. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people point. don't know in Colombia, it's separated into like five or six different sections, and in different areas have completely right. different dialects of not only Spanish, That's right. But there's slang, and some of them have the uh, Albert. Not the. I was going to say Alborigines. Um, the uh, the, the native, indigenous. I think indigenous. Yeah. And everybody in my neighborhood has motorcycles. Taino. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a nice day outside in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, no, you can go. You can go. Uh, you can go to. Um, let's see. Someone was just saying they went to uh, South Africa. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely going back to Africa. We barely touched the surface, scratched the surface, went to South Africa and Ghana. Obviously, it's a big continent. I want to go to North Africa, uh, maybe Morocco, uh, maybe even Egypt. I'm not sure. Uh, but then also Ethiopia is just sitting there waiting, waiting, No, waiting, just waiting. to kind of read the comment um, out loud so that, you know, um, anybody who yeah. listens to an audio version of the show, uh, we saw your episodes from South Africa prior to our own trip and ironically went to the, some of the same places you went. We loved it. Will you be returning to Africa? And that's the answer to that question. Yeah. Now, uh, someone it's, earlier asked then, about Australia. Have you been to Australia? Yeah, well, Australia is obviously very far. Um, and uh, But I meet a lot of Australians, and uh, we've talked about it. You know, almost every place has been on the table. Someone asked a question if there's some places that were not interested in going for political or any other reasons. And, and there's places that, that are like that, like uh, Turkey, for example. I don't want to go – Turkey right now, uh, not because of fear for my own safety, just because I don't want to support somebody that's just so, it seems, you know, so anti-freedom of speech. Um, I, I went to Cuba because people were curious about Cuba, and I wanted to show, I knew, because I had been to Cuba, about what the real Cuba was like, and I was frustrated that this very glib version of Cuba that we got, it's either an evil empire or this beautiful place where you can go and just, you know, live in old buildings and like no one seemed to be telling the real story because they were always censored and I just didn't want to do that. So politics aside, we try not to be a political show, but there are some tenements. I, I, I don't believe freedom of speech is a political issue. If it is, then you have to question the politics of the place that you're visiting uh, because that's a human issue in my view. Those are things that I feel really strongly about. So I will always sort of 
bring those to the surface, but I try not to be like on some kind of like, you know, mission to, you know, that's way above my pay grade, man. I am just, you know, I try to recognize my strengths and weaknesses, you know, but at the same time, if I can get out a message that I feel like needs getting out, like ugly fruit is beautiful, guys. It's beautiful. The uglier the fruit, the better. That means it wasn't, it's probably organic, you know, what we call organic here, people just call food elsewhere. And so when I travel to other places and I eat the food and I feel better, I don't think it's a mistake. And so I think that's part of me having this travel experience and reporting back to folks uh, this experience that I had. Hmm. You know, so I, I try not to get political, but at the same time, there are certain things that are just need to be said. So I try to say those, you know. Rob, I hope that answered your question. Hope that answered everybody's questions. Well, Robert, uh, I do appreciate you coming on the show we're at an hour so i don't know if you want to continue yeah but um uh, I, I don't know covered a lot of territory yeah sorry i'm just i'm shielding the sun in my eyes <laughs> not you guys I'm like, <laughs> bye um carlos no man it's been good dude i mean thank you guys for um tuning in i know there'll be some people that'll be watching afterwards i hope the nfl can deal with the ratings bump uh hit that they took because we went <laughs> facebook live carlos I'm sure I feel kind we, of guilty. You know, we had thousands of watching live, and no, well, I hope they, well, we, we, hope um, they can handle the hit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is raw travel, and obviously we're on the raw travel page. So some of you are either following, or some of you are followers of mine, and and decided to join. And I do appreciate that greatly. Uh, I do these shows very consistently, uh, maybe not every week, but I try my best, and we cover everything from celebrities and musicians and filmmakers. And Rob is an independent producer, so uh, it fit in line with uh, things that I cover. And not only that, but I've known him for a number of years, and he's just, what a force to reckon with, to be able to do a world show, a show, and, and bring it into light in the most positive way that I can think of, and bring out not only the neighborhoods and areas that are not necessarily very touristy, but uh, but then you can also contribute and participate in what's going on in those locations. Um, once again, yeah. uh, we also want to re remind everybody as far as the contest. So the contest is at rawtravelgiveaway.com if you want to win a trip. It's not available yet, though, right? It's, uh, it's coming up yeah, soon. Yeah, I think, yeah, just sort of bookmark that because that may not, you know, you can enter right now, but I'm not sure if your entry is going to make it. So, you know, maybe bookmark it. Enter next weekend for sure. It will be up and running. Uh, I think it is already, but... Just, I don't want to see you enter and then be disappointed that you weren't entered. So, um, yeah, make sure to enter anytime, I'd say, by Thursday, Friday, next week. We should be good. And I'm sure and, that you'll uh, post I something also, on this very page to let everybody know that it's open and available. But I thought I wanted to put that lower third again just to make sure people might can write it down and, and, uh, and join Thank that. you. So is there anything else You're you want to let people man, know? Carlos. No, I just I want to take the opportunity to thank you, man, because you have been interviewing me since before the show began um because i remember i was in my la apartment i think the first time we did it I, right. I did it from miami on the road and um we've had a couple of these one where you were in my apartment when you were in new york city mm -hmm. and now this one and you know listen man we're doing it because there's some people that want to you know hear what we have to say and um as much work as it is i want to take the time to do it but I also want to thank you for doing it, man, because you're not getting paid for this. You're just doing it out of your own, uh, the goodness of your own heart. Um, I don't know. You might be making, uh, maybe you're making money off this later on. I hope you are. <laughs> uh, but um, I owe you at least a raw travel hat, man. So uh, right. after this, so it gets cold in Atlanta, man. <laughs> it does. It gets a little chilly. Right? Not nowhere near like New York. Yeah. And I just moved away no, from New no, York, no. so I know what that's like. That's right. But it gets like 40 degrees. You guys are like, oh, it's so cold. So, you know, you need oh, a yeah, travel Over hat. here, yeah, people, uh, 56, 70 yeah. degrees. They're like, oh, it's cold. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cold. If it's not 90. And, uh, but thank you, man. Thank you so much uh, for doing this for us. Really appreciate it. And, now, do you want to uh, share? Thank all the viewers for your support. Do you want to share anything yeah. as far as how people can follow you? Yeah, yeah. In, in case you're watching the video. So basically all the socials are Raw Travel TV. Very important you put TV at the end, or you might end up uh, with an Australian walkabout tour company. They'll take you on a walkabout, and they look like a good tour company, but it's not us. Um, a lot of times, 
<laughs> a lot of times we'll show up and they'll be like, oh, you know, I love your tours. And I'm like, no, we're a TV show. You left off the TV. So Raw Travel TV, uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. I recommend that you do that because we're probably not going to put full episodes up on YouTube, but we will show where the full episodes are going to be. They're probably going to be on Vimeo, uh, on some kind of pay-per-view, buy a season pass kind of basis of our old seasons. So that's going to happen this year, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. And, uh, you know, just follow us on Facebook. That's where most of the updates go. If you want to hear my strong opinions about stuff, you can go to Twitter uh, and then Instagram, of course. And I ain't got time for Snapchat. Ain't gonna lie. <laughs> so don't waste your time. All right. Now, if uh, anybody's interested in what I do and what I, uh, in, in my social media, it is Carlos Phoenix, spelled like such. And um, p- feel free to subscribe to my channel. This episode will also be on the loungenetwork.com or the Lounge Network on YouTube, and you can watch it there. Uh, Otherwise, you can watch the replay here. But um, that's what I do, and thank you so much for watching. And awesome, thank you, Robert, for allowing me to have the pleasure of talking to you about what you're doing and your travels. Thank you, man. I just want to say one more shout-out, and that's to the viewers. Guys, without you, no raw travel. Trust me. And I, you know, this has been the most fulfilling I said the volunteerism was, but I think maybe the most fulfilling is just the interactions we've had with viewers. Um, it's shocking, surprising, with all the choices of things to watch. You guys choose Raw Travel, and, and that means a lot to me, and I try not to take that for granted. And it is the only reason, uh, quite frankly. It ain't the money. It is the only reason I continue to do it, man. It's not the ego stroke because I don't get much out of it um, from that point of view either. Um, okay, so... Thank you, fans. Cool. Thank you, Carlos. All right, well, Didn't then let's the just uh, wave just everybody off goodbye, that. and we'll go through our credits. Right. Ciao.